Lord God, we thank you for your word, which is a firm foundation on which we can stand in times of turmoil and uncertainty. So Lord God, help each one of us to stand firmly on your word this morning. I pray God that your word would accomplish in our hearts, our minds and lives, that which you have set it forth to accomplish. That Lord God, you would be honored and glorified in this time. For we pray in Jesus name, amen. So speaking of his own death in John 16, 32, Jesus says to his disciples, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. Just think about that last bit for a minute. Scattered, each to his own home. Now, I know that Jesus is talking about the disciples' response to his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion. But I suspect that this is something that we can all relate to uh, in these days, uh, given the events of the last week, scattering each to our own home. And in response to this, this global pandemic, which has claimed the lives of so many people around the world already, uh, and in the hopes of mitigating the spread in our own communities, we all, I hope, have been practicing social distancing and, and in some cases, complete isolation. As Jesus said, the time has come and we have each scattered to our own home. And I suspect like, like those first disciples who, who scattered after Jesus' arrest, we too are, are struggling with fear uh, in the face of this uncertainty. But as you all know, we need to resist this fear as much as possible. We need to consistently fight against feelings of fear and hopelessness. And, and Jesus gives us the reason why in the next verse. He gives us the reason in verse 33. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The trials and challenges of life, large, small, even global, are inevitable. However, in the midst of these things, in the, in the midst of COVID-19, Jesus wants us to have peace. And the reason that we can have peace is because Jesus has overcome the world. In his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension, in his promise to come again, Jesus has overcome our two greatest enemies, sin and death. And friends, the rest, the rest is details. Now these words from John 16, 32 and 34 are, or, um, 33 are a great comfort to me and, and I hope to you as well as, as we go through this strange and difficult time because they remind us that Jesus is bigger than anything that this world can throw at us. Right? They remind us that Jesus is bigger than the coronavirus. He's bigger than loneliness and isolation. He's bigger than financial hardship and food shortages. And when we are in him, when we are in Christ, we can know his peace. No matter what's happening in us or around us, no matter what's happening outside our, our windows. Instead of responding to our current situation, to, to the reality of our scattering in fear, we need to respond in faith. I think this means watching what we put into ourselves. And what I mean by that is the more we watch the news, well, at least not for me, I don't know about you, but the more I watch the news, the more fearful I can become. And the more fearful I become, the less faith-filled I will be. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be informed about what's happening in the world around us. I think it's important in these days. But what I am saying is that we need to limit our exposure 
to the negative, to things which breed fear and hopelessness. And we need to seek to fill our hearts and our minds and our homes, our relationships with things that build us up, things that build up our faith and instead of tearing it down. We need to follow, I think, Paul's advice in Philippians 4 verse 8. Finally, beloved, Paul writes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. The more we think about these kinds of things that Paul lists here, the more we focus on faith, the less fearful we will be. And I know that I don't need to tell you, friends, that we, we're people of faith. We're people of trust and we're people of hope. And our lives rest securely in the hands of our merciful and loving God. The Lamb is on the throne, especially in times of uncertainty and fear. This is, this is the good news that we need to proclaim in the face of all of the bad news that we've been hearing from around the world. And this is the good news that the world so desperately needs to hear. Now more than ever. Now, one of the best ways that we can fill ourselves with good things and nurture and strengthen our faith is to focus on God. Focus on his character, on his nature, on his promises. Promises that can be found in his very names, right? And who he is. And so over the next few weeks during this time of scattering, I want to offer a series of reflections on the names of God as a reminder of who it is that we trust in, how he promises to meet our deepest needs and how we can be strengthened, comforted and encouraged uh, in this time of uncertainty that we find ourselves in. And so I want to begin this morning by looking at uh, the name Jehovah Jireh, uh, which, if you don't know, uh, means the Lord, our provider. The Lord, our provider. Jehovah Jireh. Um, now, as I've already said, the events over the past few days have created an increase, I think, uh, globally uh, in worry and in anxiety and in stress. And, and you can see it. You can see it in the eyes of those scanning the empty shelves in the grocery store. And, and you can hear it in the voices of those who, who because of business closures and, and social distancing, uh, are no longer able to work and, and are worried uh, about how they're going to pay their rent. Jesus addresses this worry and this anxiety and this fear head on in our reading this morning from Luke. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. And, and haven't we learned that over the last few days? He continues, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink and do not keep worrying for it is the nations that strive for these things and your father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Like, can you relate to what Jesus is saying here? I mean, whether we're worrying about getting sick not having enough money to, to pay our bills or whether there's going to be enough food or toilet paper, right? Whether we're anxious because of feeling isolated and alone. Jesus offers us here the antidote in the midst of stress and anxiety and, and even impending doom, which is what we hear when we turn on the news. Jesus tells us not to worry or fear because God is our Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lord, our provider. 
Now this name first appears in Genesis chapter 22 when, when Abraham, out of obedience to God, is about to sacrifice his son Isaac and God suddenly provides a ram instead. And it's a great story about faith and, and obedience and God's provision. And I, I encourage you to read the story in, uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 22 later today. But just as God provided for Abraham in his moment of need... We don't need to fear the future. We don't need to worry that we won't have enough because God is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord, our provider, or as it's literally translated, the one who sees, or what I like better, the one who sees to it. Our God is the one who sees to it. I want to spend just a few minutes, if you haven't already logged off, <laughs> looking at what it means for us then to depend on Jehovah Jireh in the midst of a global pandemic and how he promises to meet our deepest needs no matter what our circumstances. So, so number one, depending on God as Jehovah Jireh means seeing God as our source seeing God as our source. I think the last few days have shown us how quickly things can fall apart, right? It's especially those things that we depend on for everyday living, those, those things that we take for granted. But at the same time, I think these last few days, I hope, have reminded us that God is the source of all things. And there are four truths, I think, in that statement that we need to remember. Number one, we may think that we have earned the things in our life, but really, it's all gift. Let me say that again. We may think that we have earned all the things that we have in our life, but really, it is all gift. The book of James, chapter 117 reads, Every good and perfect gift is from God above. Right? This crisis has shown us, I think, just how much we take for granted, especially the basics. Think about it. We don't earn the air that we breathe. We don't earn the water we drink, the sunlight, this earth. We don't earn our lives, our gifts, our talents, our abilities. Everything that we are and everything that we have comes from God. It, it, it's a gift of His grace. The second thing we need to remember is there is nothing that we need that God cannot provide. Philippians 4.19 says, God will supply all that you ever need from His glorious resources in Christ Jesus. I love that verse. Uh, the, the shelves in grocery stores may be empty. They may be running out of your favorite products. Uh, but God's storehouse, God's storehouse is never empty. Right? The glorious resources in Christ never end. God's resources are unlimited. His cup is always running over. The problem is, the problem is that things are not equalized. Things aren't shared. Some people have a lot and others have none, right? It's not a matter of scarcity, it's a matter of greed. We've seen, I think, this ugly truth as well over the past few days as, as some people have been hoarding uh, toilet paper and, and all kinds of crazy things. However, God can and will provide, and he often does, interestingly enough, through us through our acts of kindness, through our acts of generosity. Right? There's nothing that we need that God can't provide. Number three, God wants to provide. He wants to provide. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 11, if your child asks you for bread, would you give him a stone? How much more likely is that your heavenly father will give good things to those who ask him? Right, when, my, when my children ask for food, and they do it all the time, I don't give them a piece of rubber to chew on. Right? If I want to meet the needs of my children, and trust me, I'm imperfect. Those of you who know me, you know that. Certainly God, certainly God who is perfect, 
wants to meet our needs. Right? We need to trust that. And finally, number four, uh, God is waiting on us. God is waiting on us. If, if we have needs in our lives that aren't being met, it is not God's fault. Right? James 4 verse 2 puts it very clearly. You do not have because you do not ask. And so this tells me that, that the problem isn't that God doesn't want to meet our needs. The problem is that sometimes we don't ask. We, we surrender to fear or we surrender to the chaos. Over and over again, from Genesis to Revelation, God encourages us to ask him for the things we need, to, to come to him like a child to a loving parent and to trust that he will provide. Right, Jesus says in Luke eleven nine, 9, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And, and we need to remember, of course, that in the original Greek, uh, the tense there is continuous. So keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. Keep on asking. In other words, we need to be persistent in our prayer. Now, let me offer you a caveat here. It's important that we remember for each one of these four things that I've said that we need to distinguish between needs and wants. Right? God promises to meet our needs and, and not necessarily all of our wants. So we need to keep that in mind. So just let's stop there and think about this idea as, as Jehovah Jireh, our source. Right? Who, who is your source? Or what is your source? Is it, is it your job? Is it your, your retirement fund or other investments? Is it your own strength and ability and intellect? I mean, these things are all well and good, and, and they may provide some sense of security, but, but ultimately, as we've seen, we can't depend on them, especially when things fall apart. Only God can meet our needs. Only Jehovah Jireh can be our source. So that's number two. We need to depend on him as our source. Uh, sorry, number one. Number two, depending on Jehovah Jireh means trusting God for today. And I, I think this is so important in this season that we find ourselves in. Trusting God for today. I mean, notice that we don't pray, give us this week or give us this month or give us this year our daily bread. Right? Jesus was very clear, give us this day our daily bread. And I think what God says to us is he says, I'm going to make this simple. I want you to take life in bite-sized pieces, 24-hour increments. I want you to trust me one day at a time, or maybe one moment at a time even, and then let me deal with the rest. So how do we do this? I mean, how do we practically trust God one day at a time? Well, I think Paul uh, gives us a clue in Philippians 4. He says, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need thanking him for all he has done and fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right think about these things that are pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise i cut a little bit out there but you get the point so i think there are four steps in this passage that we can follow to uh, trust god for today and step number one worry about nothing now, even as I say that, I can acknowledge that this is one of the hardest commands in all of the Bible, at least for me to obey, right? I'm fine with do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. I mean, I got those nailed down, <laughs> but do not worry, right? We can break this one several times a day. I mean, get, we're not even in a global pandemic. But if you think about it, Worrying says, really, when it comes right down to it, worrying says that we don't trust God to provide. We don't have faith in his goodness. We don't have faith in his love. We don't believe that he'll keep his promises. 
Now, you know, I've been accused of being black and white, and I, and I, and I, I think I'm getting more so as I get older, but, but really, we can't worry and depend on God at the same time. It really is an, an either-or thing in any given situation. So Jesus says in our reading, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And isn't that the truth? Today's trouble is enough for today. But did you know that every time God gives us a negative, don't do this, he always follows with a positive. Do this instead. And so this leads to number two, right? Number one is we don't worry. Number two, pray about everything. Pray about everything. Friends, it is so clear to me now. We've got two choices. We can either panic or we can pray. Panic or pray. And, and as you all know only too well, worry has never solved a single problem. Right? Worrying is simply stewing without doing. Prayer, however, prayer changes things. Prayer invites God into a situation and gives him permission to act. Right? Prayer unleashes the power of God. And notice Paul says here, pray about everything. In other words, nothing is too insignificant. Nothing is too small for us to bring to the Lord. Elsewhere in Romans 8, 32, Paul writes, Since God did not spare even his own son for us, but he gave him up for all of us, won't he also surely give us everything else? I mean, that's a powerful, powerful verse if you think about it. I mean, if God cared enough to die for us, then he's going to care enough to take care of all of our other needs as well, even the little things. Right? He hasn't brought us this far just to abandon us. We need to pray about everything. Step number three, Paul says, thank God. Thank God. Now, this is something that we can often forget to do, let alone in a time of crisis. But no matter what's happening in our lives, we can give thanks to God simply for who he is. We can give thanks to God because he is Jehovah Jireh. He is our source. And as we take one day at a time, we can trust that he will see us through. But being thankful in all things keeps us from worrying. Being thankful in all things keeps us from getting angry or bitter. Being thankful in all things keeps us from losing hope. And being thankful in all things keeps us from taking things for granted. Psalm 136 verse 1 instructs, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. We need to thank God. And finally, step number four, think about the right things. Think about the right things. As I've already said, if we fill our minds with worry and fear, we will be depressed and discouraged. However, if we fill our minds with the things of God, we'll be lifted up, we'll be encouraged. Isaiah 26 verse 3 reads, God will keep in perfect peace. I love that, perfect peace. God will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in him, whose thoughts turn often to the Lord. That's a great question. Uh, in this season we find ourselves in. Do your thoughts turn often to the Lord? I mean, if not, where, where do they turn? Only God can meet our needs, and we need to trust Jehovah Jireh for today, for this moment. And finally, number three, uh, depending on Jehovah Jireh means sharing what God provides sharing what God provides. This is going to be so important, I think, in the coming days. And notice Jesus, when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Not my daily bread. I think there's something in that. Now, I'm stretching a bit here, but I do think it's supported elsewhere in Scripture. 
that whenever God gives us something, he wants us to share it with others. And why does he want that? Because I think God wants us in our life to learn to be more like him. And God is a giver, right? John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave, dot, dot, dot. God is a giver. He's generous. I believe that God put us on this planet and every day he's watching. He's watching to see what we will do with the things that he has given us, right? No matter how much or how little we have. So will we keep our hands clutched and, and hoard for ourselves out of greed or, or fear that there won't be enough? Or will we have faith in God and open our hands and share what God has given us? Here are three quick principles for giving. Number one, what God gives to me, he wants to give through me. What God gives to me, he wants to give through me. Second Chronicles 16.9 reads, The Lord's eye scans the whole world to find those whose hearts are committed to him. The Lord is looking for people in the midst of this crisis whose hearts are turned towards him. People that he can use to, to bless the world, to, to bring healing and hope to the world. And so God looks at us and he asks, will you take only for yourself? Or will you be a channel for me to other people? Think about that. Will you take only for yourself or will you be a channel for God to other people? Principle number two, when I meet, uh, when I meet others' needs, God will take care of mine. Right? That's a kingdom principle. Jesus says in, in Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Right? As I've already said, we can't, uh, we can't receive when our hands are closed. They need to be open. We need to release instead of hoard. And finally, number three, most importantly, what I give, God multiplies. Right? What I give, God multiplies. This also is a kingdom principle. If I give God my time, talents, and treasures, if, if I share with others what I have, if I, if I give a roll of toilet paper to my neighbor or a loaf of bread to the guy across the street, God promises that he will multiply it, that he will use it in some way. Remember, Jesus was able to feed 5,000 people uh, with one boy's offering of five loaves and two fish. And I love what uh, Proverbs 11.24 tells us. It says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. So let me ask you, as, as we, as we uh, you know, face this, this crisis, how big is your world? And are your hands opened? Or are they closed? You know, the reality is, it is impossible for us to outgive God, right? It's impossible to outgive God, but I dare you in the coming days to try. I dare you with your family, your friends, your neighbors, the stranger on the street that you pass at a respectable social distance, <laughs> uh, that, you will, that you will reach out and give. Only God can meet our needs. Depending on Jehovah Jireh means sharing, friends, what he's supplied. So I'm going to stop now. Um, but we are in unprecedented times. And things, as you know, are changing quickly. Who knows what next week will bring? However, in our reading this morning, Jesus tells us very clearly not to worry. He tells us, uh, that it is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Do not be afraid, little flock. Your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. My right? God, our God, as Jehovah Jireh, he's our provider. 
It's his pleasure to give us the kingdom to provide for our needs. All that we have to do is ask, depend on him by seeing God as our source, by trusting him for today and by sharing with others what he's given us. I think it's important that we remember this as individuals and as a church community, whether you're part of Living Waters or whether you've tuned in from another church community. I mean, this time of uncertainty and fear presents us with an opportunity as the people of God and the body of Christ to rise up and to actually be the church in the world. And by church, I don't mean a building. I mean people. Ambassadors for Jesus to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors. To reach out to a world that, that God loves. The question that we have to ask ourselves, again, as individuals and, and as a church community, is do we really believe this? Do we really believe that God is our Jehovah Jireh? That he will provide for all of our needs in these difficult days? Ask yourself that. Friends, in the days and weeks ahead, as, as you are scattered, each to your own home, are you prepared to trust God enough to do your part? And then to let Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, do the rest. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that indeed you are our great provider. Lord, all good gifts come from you. And Lord, in this season of fear and, and uncertainty and social isolation and sickness, uh, Lord, we lean into you and, and we thank you that you are our source. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would rise up in each one of us and, and overcome fear with faith. Lord, help us to be your children, your sons and daughters, and your ambassadors in the world. Lord, not having clenched hands and hoarding for ourselves, Lord, but reaching out and sharing the love of Jesus uh, and the practical needs of life uh, to those around us. Uh, Lord God, we just pray that your will would be done in this season, that you would help us, Lord, to be attentive to what you're doing and what you're saying in these days. And Lord, and that you would use us uh, for your glory and your goodness. For we pray in Jesus' name.